Hello, I'm David Beckman, the Executive Director of the Christian Studies Center of Chattanooga, and I want to welcome you to our discussion of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with Michael Ward. Michael is uh, arguably the top C.S. Lewis scholar of our day. He's certainly an expert on the Chronicles of Narnia. Not a better person to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the, of the publish, publication of The Lion, the Witch, and Wardrobe, but with Michael. In fact, it was Michael that let me in on the fact that it was the anniversary. I wasn't keeping track. Michael is a senior research fellow at Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford, and he also teaches apologetics at Houston Baptist University. I'll leave more information about uh, Dr. Ward at the end of this video, but for now, let's go ahead and join the discussion. Michael Ward, thank you so much for taking time to, to talk with me today. I appreciate it very much. Um, on the 16th of October in 1950, 70 years ago, Jeffrey Bless Publishers released the first edition of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, illustrated by Pauline Baines. And uh, we, in hindsight, realized that this was a very important event. Uh, what would you say uh, was uh, important about this as far as the history of English literature in the 20th century? What would you like to talk about? Well, yeah, I mean, the book has gone on to become one of the classics of English children's fiction, hasn't it? Uh, so it's worth marking the, uh, the moment it first came before the public 70 years ago. Um, there are not many books which last 70 years, to be honest. <laughs> True. <laughs> when you think about it, there were barrow loads, shed loads of books that were published for children in 1950, but most of them went through one printing and you know sank without trace. So any book that, that has even a second printing has done remarkably well, uh, let alone to go on to sell millions and millions of copies around the world for decades in now, I think over 40 different languages. Wow, uh, 40. So it's, um, it's become an absolutely, uh, I think probably permanently established part of the canon of English children's fiction. And of all Lewis's output, everything, every single thing that he wrote, academic writings and poetry and his other fiction and his Christian apologetics, undoubtedly The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is his most famous book and the one which will last longest. Mm. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure people will still be reading it in 200 years time. It, it's, it's an absolute yeah. classic. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk for a few minutes about um, why Lewis uh, wrote this book. Uh, we know that uh, um, he, he wrote the book, uh, you, uh, interested in, um, well, he caring about a number of issues, uh, the imagination of children. Um, I'll, I'll let you elaborate a little bit more, but I was just going to say that uh, he apparently did not uh, intend to write uh, seven books initially, but he wrote this one and, uh, then it proceeded to, to go on from there. Um, and that, that sort of plays into the whole argument about uh, which book should you read first. We, maybe we can talk about that also. But let's, yeah. go, let's just go back to motivations. Uh, why why uh, did Lewis write this book? Well, he never fully explains why. He just says in one place that he, uh, there, was, there came a year in his life when he felt that he must write a fairy tale or he would burst. <laughs> Um, and he talks also about having had pictures in his mind, uh, a fawn carrying parcels in a snowy wood, a magnificent lion, a queen on a sledge. He said some of these images had been in his mind's eye since he was, I think, 16. And one day he just said to himself, let's make a story out of it. Uh, he doesn't really explain why. Um, he he talks about how Aslan came bounding into the imaginative process, which which seems already to have, have gotten underway. Uh, he says mm -hmm. there was nothing obviously Christian about the story to begin with. Uh, though obviously as soon as Aslan comes in, it takes on a more obviously Christian hue. Um, and yes, he also says that he only had one book in mind when he started out. Uh, and from various letters that he wrote, it seems that he didn't have all seven in mind until he'd written three or four of them. Uh, but after he'd written three or four of them, um, 
he evidently decided he would do all seven. And it's worth pointing out that he had completed four of them before the first one, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe was even published. Mm. So he knew there was going to be a series by the time the first one came out. Ah, okay. Um, and so he was, if he needed to make any adjustments for the sake of the series, um, he could do that. And indeed, there's a sort of indication in the very final sentence of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe that it is the beginning of, of a sequence, uh, because uh, we're told, aren't we, in the, in the final sentence that, um, uh, let me just get my copy of the book, um, that this, if the professor was right, this was only the beginning of the adventures of Narnia. You know, so yeah. stay tuned, kids, there's more coming. Yeah, if the professor was right and if the books sold, <laughs> yes. the publishers right. would be willing to publish more of them. Yeah. Well, I mean, Lewis already had sufficiently uh, sufficient name recognition and right. sufficient right. cachet as a writer that he could be pretty sure that yeah. he was going to sell well enough for there to be at least a second book. Um, Prince Caspian, Prince Caspian, The Return to Narnia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think it is quite important to, to get clear in our minds that The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the first of the sequence. Mm -hmm. And you should not start, under no circumstances, should you, if you're the first, if, if, you're, a, if you're a first time reader of the series, under no circumstances should you start with The Magician's Nephew. Sure, yeah. I mean, even in, in The Magician's Nephew, he, uh, he writes as if he assumes that uh, you have read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe because of the little comments that he makes. Exactly. And, yeah. um, and also with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he assumes that you do not know, for instance, who Aslan is. Because mm, when right. Aslan is first mentioned, the chil we're told that the children knew no more about Aslan than you do, you the reader. <laughs> Yes. Of course, if you've already read The Magician's Nephew, you do know who Aslan is. <laughs> right, it's false. <laughs> wasted it. Yeah. I'm really annoyed with publishers who, who stick a whacking great number one on The Magician's Nephew or, or put it first in a, in a multi-volume uh, book. Yes. It, doesn't, it ruins certain effects. It does, it does. I'm afraid it does. Yeah. Well, be that as it may, I know there's a certain person that says it's his fault because publishers had asked him to, his recommendation, but, uh, you know, that, I mean, the it, thing uh, is, it, it is, it is in, in a way, it's C.S. Lewis's own fault because he, mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a letter to a kid, a yeah. child had written to him suggesting it was re best read in the chronological order with Magician Nephew first, and Lewis wrote back to his child saying, yes, I agree with you, but you know, that was one of probably 30 letters Lewis wrote before breakfast that morning, and he didn't <laughs> expect that it would be preserved and held up and used in evidence against him. <laughs> yes, used as evidence against him. Well, I mean, uh, and I'm sure you, you can uh, speak to this. Um, when it comes to uh, issues of chronology and, um, you know, j just the, the whole business, especially about his own works, well, you know, Lewis would write a book and basically forget about it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like uh, I can just see him uh, just saying, well, just, you know, just just use the chronology because he's not even thinking about the chronology himself. I mean, what do you think? And because that's what I thought about that particular letter. I thought, you know, why did you say, well, I just don't give Lewis much credence on it, I guess. No, neither do I. I mean, it, it just if you're if you're mapping out the whole series uh, from beginning to end, uh, for someone who knows nothing about it, then it does make sense to begin with the Genesis story, the magician's nephew, um, for an overview of the series. But if you're talking about reading it, especially first-time readers, you must, must, must start with the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just literarily, it, it, it's just obvious that the way that we should be introduced to Narnia is we're going with Lucy through the wardrobe. And that's just the way it works out. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you, you talked about uh, Lewis, the, the, uh, you know, he and his references to how he composed the story. Uh, that, you know, he, he was no J.K. Rowling with everything all mapped out ahead of time, but he just had these pictures in his mind and he started working with them. Um, and you mentioned uh, Aslan bounding into the story. Um, and uh, so why don't we talk about Aslan uh, for just a few minutes and um, you, how, where would you like to yourself sort of bound into the discussion about Aslan? Uh, 
Yeah, well, there's so much to say, isn't there? I mean, Aslan is, yeah. is one of the main reasons for the success of the book and indeed of the series as a whole. He's the only character who appears in all seven books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and in one of the stories, he's, he's, he's said to be at the back of all the stories, which he is. You know, he's yeah. the most important character. He, he's the logical center of everything. And... Um, yeah, he's orchestrating everything. Yes. He brings the children in and he's got things for that he wants them to do. And he has, his, therefore, it's part of the fulfilling of his purposes for Narnia. Yeah. Though it's also worth pointing out that although he's the most important character, um, Lewis doesn't overuse him. He rations and manages Aslan's appearances quite sk skillfully, quite sparingly, you might even say. Um, I mean, in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Aslan's name is not even mentioned until the seventh chapter. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't appear in person to speak and do anything until the twelfth chapter out of 17. So, you know, that's about what two thirds of the way into the mm -hmm. book and he mm -hmm. hasn't appeared or mm -hmm. done it. Yeah. Um, he's been mentioned and the, the sheer mention of his name is enough to get the children thinking and feeling in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, but, but he's held back. It's interesting that Lewis, you know, although, you know, the title of the book is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, mm -hmm. the lion himself does not appear until, until the 12th chapter out of 17, mm -hmm. which is remarkable. Um, but also, I think, quite canny on Lewis's part, because when you have a divine character, when you have a, you know, a sort of, in one sense, omnipotent character, if you use him too much and too obviously, he sucks all the oxygen out of the room, as it were. <laughs> um, you, you begin to wonder what there is for any other character to do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why mm -hmm. the, the sort of narrative focus mm -hmm. is always on the children. And they're always looking to and revolving around Aslan but we see the story through the children's eyes, not, not yes. through Aslan's eyes, which is, which yeah. is right and proper. Yeah, so as the children discover, as we mentioned before, as the children discover Aslan, he's introduced, we discover Aslan, and uh, we learn about him with the children. Uh, mm. we're, we're going through the story with them imaginatively. Yes. Yeah. And I think in some ways, Lewis learnt the importance of of holding back a, a Christ character, a divine character, uh, from from the first book that he wrote after he became a Christian, his own uh, sort of allegorical, autobiographical mm -hmm. account of his conversion, The Pilgrim's Regress, there is a, a, a moment in that book towards the end where, where a man appears, and that man is clearly meant to be Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but Lewis says in a letter or a comment somewhere that he deliberately kept Christ out of the story pretty largely because he says that all sorts of dramatic difficulties arise as soon as you have a have Christ on the state on the stage on the page um, not only sucking the oxygen out of the room as I mentioned but also you know simply the fact of of giving your Christ character words to say that are are believable are coming from the mouth of such a person um, and this is a, a thing that Lewis had studied and thought about quite deeply in his in his own work as a literary critic and literary historian. If you look at his book on the 16th century, he talks there about uh, the works of Sir Thomas More and how Sir Thomas More, in a, in a number of uh, books that he wrote, um, a treatise on the Passion, uh, and another book uh, whose name whose title I forget, uh, Lewis says that Thomas More puts words into Jesus's mouth which are just incredible. You, you can't imagine that the Christ character would ever say such things. You know, long convoluted sentences, <laughs> sort of and slightly almost um, irritated words, ir irritated sentences. I am, as I have diverse times told you, the very <laughs> bread of life. Um, and Lewis points out how Sir Thomas More, Saint Thomas More, as he, as he has become, um, although he's you know, re remarkably sensitive to the to the meaning of of the dominical utterances. You know, the words of Jesus in the Bible. He was nonetheless very deaf to their tone and couldn't recreate it in his own in his own imagination. Yeah, uh, there are examples 
Lewis points out uh, where, it, where it is done successfully. And he, he mentions the imitation of Christ by uh, uh, Thomas Akempis. He says all sorts of words are given to Jesus in that book, which work and, and sound believable. Um, so he'd obviously, he'd, he'd spent quite a lot of intellectual effort thinking about how you make a, a Jesus character credible as a, as a dramatic creation. And when you look at Aslan, he, he really succeeds. I mean, Aslan is just a brilliantly successful literary creation. He works. You, you love him, which is the absolutely central point, of course. Yeah. But you also believe in, in the variety of his operations so that, you know, he can be he can be stroked and we're told about his lovely golden fur and his mane that the children bury their faces in and he's got beautiful eyes and can weep precious tears. Um, and you can romp with him, you can dance with him. But the children say in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe that whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or playing with a kitten, <laughs> they could never work out. Yeah. And that's just genius. It is genius, it is. Perhaps yeah. The words kitten and thunderstorm apply to the same character and to be equally believable because of course he is you know he's thunderous as well he's yeah he's a lion he's, he's, a he's not one. a tame lion he's got claws yeah which would be terrible if he didn't know how to velvet them we're told yeah he's got yeah. a roar that can bend the trees mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and he's got a kind of solidity and majesty about him which means that that the children know they aren't to mess with him and he just looks them in the eye sometimes and they sort of quail and they have to tell him the truth um so to have all that going on in one character and for it to be credible for, it, for, it, for Aslan not to come over a sort of schizophrenic is 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 a real achievement and I think the main reason it works if, is of course the beautifully simple and obvious reason that Aslan is a lion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't have to be a lion. <laughs> no, he didn't. But it, well, it was part of the genius of yeah. of uh, the the whole idea, you know, of the of uh, supposition, you know, which we could talk about for just a minute of how uh, if the Son of God were to appear in a world like Narnia, mm. um, how would he appear? Um, yes. And since he's the king, the king of the beasts is the lion. You know, that's just sort of a. Uh, uh, an image that we have as Westerners, and, and uh, so it was the natural thing to do. Well, yes, uh, and it, it works so well. It does work so. It, it, as you say, it's the natural choice to make as soon as he is the king. But you know, Lewis had to decide that he was going to be the king. Yes, right. He didn't have You're to right. be presented in monarchical terms. You know, there are plenty of examples of you know of Christ being figured under different forms. Mm -hmm. You know, we have uh, Christ the Tiger in T.S. Eliot's poem, Geronimo, where, you know, the tigerishness of the Christ character is deliberate, deliberately there to suggest the ferocity and, and the mm -hmm. impending judgment, mm -hmm. the fearful mm -hmm. judgment, the day of wrath mm -hmm. that is approaching. Uh, and, and that's suitable for a tiger to represent. And in mythology, you know, Christ is sometimes depicted as a as a unicorn yeah um there's an albatross know. isn't there somewhere? yeah there's, well in in the rhyme of the ancient mariner by coleridge of course yeah the albatross is a christ character and indeed you know lewis is glancing at that in the voyage of the dawn treader yes yes when right. Aslan himself takes on the form of an albatross um there's also you know the pelican in, mm -hmm. in christian mm -hmm. art the, yeah. the pelican that was thought in legend to pluck its own breast and feed its young with its own blood. Well, there's also the lamb, uh, you know, which, you know. And again, uh, Lewis yeah. uses the lamb also mm -hmm. in The Voyage of the Dawn. Sure it does. Um, but it's, oh, that, it's okay. that duality, you know, like the, the kitten and the thunderstorm, the lion and the lamb, you know, mm. the, the, the complexity of, of yeah. his personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is remarkably complex when you think about it. He's sometimes a lamb, sometimes an albatross, sometimes just a regular domestic cat, as in uh, the horse and his boy. Yes. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the silver chair, we're told that Aslan has nine names, but we're never actually told what those one. nine different names are. Um, and sometimes he's remarkably absent. Yes. Old in the voyage, we're told in the Lion, the Witch and Order, that he'll, he'll be coming and going. You mustn't 
you know, he doesn't try to keep him down. And he's not, he doesn't enter the world of Narnia at all in the silver chair. Mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't appear in the book in the last battle until all the characters are dead. Yeah. Well, that, you know, there again, we have uh, instances of Lewis very skillfully and deliberately and, and purposefully holding him back for various reasons. You know, yeah, all, it's wonderful. all these decisions were decisions that Lewis had to take and we could have gone differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we just read the finished product. And if we're, if we're not, you know, reflective readers, we just, we just drink it in and, and never ask ourselves why. Uh, but of course, every single thing is the result of a choice. Yeah. Which could have gone differitly. For li like Father Christmas in a language and wardrobe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, of the, one of the most jarring. Uh, <laughs> but there's a very good reason. Uh, you know, you might want, <laughs> you might want to go in that direction. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, 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 wonder, the wonderful understanding that uh, just, just how deep uh, Lewis's thinking is. I mean, as we've been talking about Aslan, I'm, I just am amazed at uh, just the subtleties of his comprehension of uh, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the, the way that he is able to portray him so biblically, uh, illumined not just by the Gospels, but about, but you know, through the, the whole New Testament and, and all of Scripture, really, of course. And um, so, so that the, the ass land that you see there really is uh, so much like um, the Jesus we know, at least from, from what I can tell. Um, but then there's also other layers uh, that are dictating things, um, which uh, you might want to just briefly touch on, um, especially with the line, the witch in the wardrobe being the first one um, and uh, how it yeah, was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree. I, I mean, it is, a, as I've been saying, a tremendous achievement, not just uh, dramatically, but, but doctrinally. And, you know, scripturally, there is so much of the scriptural presentation of, of the second person of the Holy Trinity yeah. being communicated uh, very effectively. However, if, if we were to be critical, there is one thing that Lewis does not include, which really you might in some way say ought to be there. You know, he, he says that Aslan pro provides the imaginary answer to the question, if there were a world like Narnia and the Son of God became incarnate there, as he has really become incarnate in our world, what would it be like? Mm -hmm. um, so he uses that word incarnate mm -hmm. for what Aslan is going to do and be in, the, in Narnia. But it's interesting that Aslan doesn't actually take flesh of, of a virgin True. Uh, in Narnia as he does in this world. And so that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Aslan, when he is incarnate, so to speak, when he arrives in Narnia in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, he's not born to a lioness. We're just told Aslan has landed. Yeah, yeah, he just shows up. As if he's a parachutist dropping in or, you know, a, a sailor docking in a harbour or something. Um, and if, if you wanted to be, you know, critical, you, you, you would really need to say that that is a, a doctrinal omission. Mm -hmm. And if you're not careful, that leads on to a kind of heretical understanding of Jesus, that he's not really flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones, which is an important doctrinal point that, you know, it is. As, the, as the church father said, that Christ could not heal that which he could not assume. Mm -hmm. And by assuming a human nature, he was able to heal us from our sins. Mm -hmm. But if he hadn't, if the bridge hadn't joined the humanity side of the gulf, but was only connected to the divine side of the gulf, then we would never have had access to the Father. So there must be a, a humanity to Jesus. And there ought really to be a, a Leonine origin to Aslan, but we're never told that there is. Uh, and so if you want to be, you know, if you want to f find fault, there's a yes. fault to find. Yeah. But I don't want, I don't want to press, I, I, you know, I think there's only so much that a uh, a fairy tale can achieve <laughs> well yes i mean you have your literary restrictions um you know the of, of your trying you know the story you're trying to tell i've i found it interesting that you know there are other lions in narnia you know there's the the one that had been turned to stone in the witch's yeah. castle that's freed um and uh, and they 
and and that lion recognizes Aslan as you know he he's you know he's one you know he's another one of us you know yeah, yeah. lion Aslan yeah 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 um, yeah so Lewis makes as much of an effort as he can to go in that so. direction yeah. without I mean it would be it would be it would complicate matters significantly if he if there was a Mary figure she would have to have her own backstory she yeah, would have right. to have her own narrative <laughs> arc. And she would, and there would really have to be some sort of equivalent of the of the Annunciation, you know, the angel coming to Mary. You'd almost have to have just another volume uh, that just told yeah. the, the the backstory. You would, because yeah. I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting how little about Mary there is in the Gospels. Yes, she's hugely important doctrinally, mm -hmm. um, and yet because the Gospels are not works of art, they're works of history and theology the gospel writers they don't feel that they must fill in the backstory about mary and mm -hmm. give her as much of a kind of dramatic trajectory as as a novelist would mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes yeah the, the the books have a particular purpose to them and um it, it's the same with, with the rest of, of scripture you know that the, the the books each book needs to be taken literally as what it is and it's got a particular purpose for why it was written it's trying to do a certain thing hmm. uh, it, it's not there to satisfy every possible question we could ever have no um, neither is it designed usually to just entertain us you know to be or, yes <laughs> to be diverting fiction yeah um, it Indeed. doesn't need to observe the canons of, of literary creativity Whereas Lewis does, if he wants the, he, if he wants his story to be successful, um, not just doctrinally but dramatically, then it must work as a story, regardless of any theological second or third meanings you might find in the story. And that that's the remarkable thing about Narnia that it does work as yeah. a simple fairy tale. You, you don't have to observe any christological or theological substructure to it mm -hmm. to enjoy it. And that's why yeah. it's such a massively genius achievement seven-year-old kids who know nothing about jesus find the story deeply involving and moving but you know learned professors and archbishops and theologians can study it you know in adulthood and still find it equally rewarding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a part of the genius of lewis is he he, he not only uh, knew that genre and and was well read in it but uh, he had the talent to mm. be able to create within that genre um, a real, real masterpiece. Mm. Uh, that he, you know, he had that extra talent. He wasn't just an academic; mm. he really was a storyteller, yeah, uh, and and very good at it. And he just had that um, that that capacity to understand, as you mentioned earlier in his uh, literary criticism, you know, to be able to see, you know, how stories were, were, were done well or not done well mm -hmm. and be able to say, all right, I need to do this or I need to do that. But just being able to present it in such a way that the final product um, is just, just so, so beautiful and inspiring. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, and, and it's a reflection of his own soul, uh, you know. Yes, his, his own soul and also his own um scholarship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, his own, and his own experience as a writer you know he, he was at the height of his powers when he wrote the line yeah, he was. already had you know about 20 years of of uh success as a writer um including other examples of fiction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so he knew what he was about and i, of, I often mention this to to young would-be writers um who want to imitate c.s lewis or tolkien and i say well Remember, they didn't really achieve success until they were in their 50s. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Real success. I mean, they, they had books published, yeah, but uh, yeah. They, didn't, they didn't write their masterpieces until they were in their 50s. Or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was Tolkien even in his 60s when, the, when Lord of the Rings came out? I don't anyway, remember. Yeah. The point is that um, it's not enough just to want to be edifying and to share your love for the Lord if you're wanting to write stories. You must also just know how to write stories. You must know how they're structured and how they work imaginatively. Yeah. And that brings me on to your other point about, you know, what, what's, uh, what may also have motivated Lewis in, in writing this book. Because um, 
Father Christmas is an interesting example of, of what some people regard as a problem to, to that first story. That, what, what does Father Christmas represent to the Narnians who know about him? You know, he turns up in Narnia and everybody seems to know that he's called Father Christmas, but, but nobody in Narnia shows any understanding of what Christmas right. <laughs> means as a word or as a thing. Um, there is no celebration of Christmas. There is no reference to Christ. So what do they mean by Father Christmas? And, you know, lots of scholars and, and critics, and indeed friends of C.S. Lewis, pointed this out to him. Roger Lansling Green, who, who um, related quite closely to Lewis or, as he was writing these books, he, he advised Lewis to leave out Father Christmas. He said he doesn't really belong there. So... The fact that Lewis retained Father Christmas, even over against Roger Lansling Green's objections, shows that Lewis must have had a very particular reason for wanting to include him. Right. And he had to have seen that there is a bit of a problem here. No, yeah, there, is, there is a bit of a problem. If, if you're thinking very strictly logic. Mm -hmm. Consistently, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think the point of the inclusion of Father Christmas is that although he might not belong there in strict logic, he does belong there emotionally and symbolically yes. and tonally and qualitatively. And this is where, if, if you don't mind, I, I'll talk briefly about my own approach to Narnia and my, my book, Planet Narnia. Yeah. Because I think that underlying, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> underlying all of what we've been talking about, you know, the simple fairy tale and the obvious parallels with the gospel, that there's a third substructure to the to the genius of the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and that has to do with Lewis's own immersion in the symbolism of the of the seven heavens, the seven planets that he writes about so extensively in his other works. He wrote a long complex poem about the planets, he uses them a lot in the Ransom trilogy, he talks about them academically in the discarded image, the planets are all over his writings and indeed in one place he says that they were permanent symbols of or, or, no, he says they were spiritual symbols of permanent value mm -hmm. that were especially worthwhile in his own generation of saturn we know more than enough but who does not need to be reminded of jove of jupiter yeah, yeah. and so J jupiter the jovial symbol for lewis was a, a absolutely crucial spiritual symbol of of one particular aspect of of christ of god yep. that is to say of his kingship because jupiter was above all things the king mm -hmm. but a particular kind of king who was uh not just you know rich and and powerful but had a kind of magnanimity and majesty about him he had a kind of kind of tragic splendor he was prosperous and and um halcyon days would come when this jupiter influence was 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 being felt um he was festive and jocund and and royal in in the richest and, and most splendid sense of that term um so i think that underlying the lion the witch and the warrior is this jovial archetype Jupiter brought about winter past and guilt forgiven, Lewis says mm -hmm. in his poem mm -hmm. about Jupiter. And they, there you have in the right, yep. right in the middle of the line of the Witch Order, the passing of winter and the forgiving of guilt, the, the, the forgiving of Edmund's treachery. Um, you have the kingship theme. The children become kings and queens. Mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of prefigured as soon as they go into the wardrobe when they put on the fur coats and we're told that they all look like... Yeah. Uh, Kings and queens, they all felt more like, how's it, how's it go? They felt like more like royal robes than coats when they put them on. Royal robes. Yeah. That's an indication that the children are themselves going to become kings and queens. They're going to participate in Aslan's kingship. Um, and the more you look into how Lewis understood the jovial symbol, and then refer back to the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the more it, 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 it comes into focus, including including father christmas yes <laughs> father christmas with his red robe as red as holly berries his his festive gift-giving jocular 
personality is the nearest thing that we have in the, well, in Lewis's Saturnine 20th century to the jovial archetype, to this Jupiter symbol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. That's one way in which he, he persists into the modern imagination. Mm -hmm. And that's why Lewis includes it, mm -hmm. that he sort of crystallizes that aspect of the story. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. And once you, once you understand that he's trying to, what? Well, yeah, you know, it's just that subliminal sort of effect, that intuitive effect of the story that has the jovial element in it, uh, mm -hmm. that he's trying to, to, to do this as part of the uh, imaginative experience in the story. Uh, Father Christmas is perfect. <laughs> he just fits yeah. in. <laughs> the cherry on the cake he's yeah he's, <laughs> right that little red blob of cherry Yo -ho -ho. <laughs> that's great so well, listen michael uh, we've we've i think we're getting pretty close to running out of time here is there anything else you want to contribute as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the line which in wardrobe um well yeah i'm just gonna quote you one thing okay by the way, uh, Michael is coming out with an article about this in October. Where will the article be published again, Michael? It will appear in the Catholic Herald, which Catholic is Herald. a okay. monthly magazine published both in the UK and now the US. And many of its articles are available free online. Um, All right. So what have you yeah, got for us? So I've just written this article about the 70th anniversary of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I point out how, you know, Alan Jacobs, the literary critic, remarks that one of the marvellous things about Narnia is that it it's a sort of training in spiritual longing, in, mm. in mm. getting us to love the right things and the right mm. people. Uh, Aslan above all. Um, that's Al Alan Jacobs' observation in The Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis. But, uh, but uh, a powerful instance of of that actually happening and being written about is, is, is in this book, uh, The Child That Books Built by Francis Spufford, um, where he talks about his childhood reading and how he loved Narnia above all books. He says they were the essence of book to him. They were the sort of platonic ideal of books. And he, he only read other books, he said, because he couldn't always be rereading Narnia. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, he says this at the end of this chapter, and I'll, I'll close with this. He, he says, uh, I had a poster map of Narnia by Pauline Baines up on the wall on the upstairs landing at home. In the top right hand corner, Pauline Baines had painted Aslan's golden face in a rosette of mane. Once, when no one was around, I crept onto the landing and kissed Aslan's nose in experimental adoration <laughs> and then fled, quivering with excited shame because I'd brought something into the real world from stories realm of infinite deniability. Isn't that that's great? great. Yeah, that's splendid. That's splendid. And that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Ward, thank you so much again for talking with me. Enjoyed it and uh, God bless you. And uh, we'll just continue to rejoice in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. Indeed. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.